Welcome, everybody, for people coming in. Uh, well, find a place. Uh, my name is Dirk. My last name is pronounced Guit, if you were wondering. I spoke on Friday with a few foreign people who had a problem with it. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about a project uh, that I did at uh, the company I work at. Uh, I'm a data scientist there in the data science and engineering team. Uh, and we, with our team, uh, solved one of our uh, business problems using machine learning. And unsurprisingly, uh, we do that with uh, deep learning. Now, there's a lot of people uh, have been talking about deep learning, how to train your models, uh, those type of things. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to talk about that. I'm more going to tell about how we went from uh, well, trying one of these things out uh, to having it fully run in production and uh, well, solving the problem, I suppose. Um, if you have questions, please uh, save them for the end. And if I make some uh, weird noises with my nose, then it's because it's hay fever season and I'm really uh, suffering from it, uh, which is kind of ironic because I work at this uh, <laughs> big flower and plant uh, company, um, which is a global marketplace for uh, flowers and plants. It's actually the biggest flower auction in the world. Um, and yeah, what we, uh, we were founded uh, a long time ago and through a series of mergers, uh, eventually this company uh, um, was left as the biggest. Um, and it's, uh, it's actually founded by the growers themselves to have, well, it actually had multiple reasons, but one of them was to have like a joint forces and uh, have a stronger position in the market on the sell side, I suppose. Um, we auction 6.7 billion uh, flowers, uh, plants and flowers every year. Um, and that's not even counting all the direct sales. So you can, it will probably come up somewhere in the 12 billions uh, of flowers and plants that go through our company. Uh, so that's a lot of logistics and uh, transactions. I also have some other boasting stats. Uh, so about 50,000 people from all over the world come to visit us. So you can imagine if 50,000 people will show up at your office uh, day in, day out. Um, the surface area of all auction halls combined is bigger than the surface area of Monaco. So that tells you something about the scale. Uh, the Alsmeer building is actually the biggest building in the world, counting by footprint. Um, and it has four bus stops, so I can actually uh, take the bus to lunch if I want to. Um, I don't do that, actually, but some people take their cars sometimes uh, sitting here. Uh, OK, so what is Royal Floral and what do we do? How does it work? Basically, what happens, um, the growers, people who grow the plants, uh, they deliver the plants to us, to one of our sites. So this is one, uh, one hall, and this is actually a fraction of what's coming in every day. It's, uh, but yeah, there's flowers and plants uh, as far as the eye can see. What then happens is that it's auctioned in... Uh, one, well, there are six of these rooms where the growers are sitting uh, and the plants, well, sometimes the plants come by and for flowers, not so much, actually. Uh, then there's the auction clock. It's auctioned by a Dutch auction system. I'll explain it later. Um, and then, well, what you see here, it's not VIP boxes. It's actually the auctioneers that uh, lead the auction. And on top of that, there's also people from all over the world uh, entering the bidding process so uh, remotely. So you don't have to actually have to be physically present in one of these halls. Now, what then happens is one of the most fun things to watch uh, uh, every day. Uh, that is that, well, everything that has come in is sold and it has to be distributed to, uh, well, the people who bought it. So it's not like somebody, well, you can actually buy one of these full carts, uh, but usually it's bought by multiple people. So it needs to be distributed to everyone. Um, and that's actually done by humans. And, uh, well, this is maybe not even a busy day, but it's really amazing how they manage to not collide with each other. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's really, it's really fun to watch. You can actually, you can just walk into the building on any day. Uh, you have to get up early, but uh, yeah, you can, uh, you can see it for yourself. So the first, um, well, the first auctions first uh, was, was, um, um, was, ma was uh, made in uh, the end of 1911. And the first flowers they sold, they sold in a pub, in a bar. And what happened is that they put all the flowers on a, on a pool table and the auctioneer would just uh, shout some price. It will start high and then would uh, lower the prices uh, over time. And then uh, the first person who says mine uh, will get the flowers for that price. And uh, the system is called a Dutch auction. And it's actually still today, uh, still the, the, well, not today, but the, still the, the, the process that is used. Only nowadays they use a clock. So they started using that. Uh, so you see all the flowers coming by and the clock goes down and the first person who uh, wants to buy the flowers at that price gets it. So over time, of course, it got a bit modernized. So now we have the stands and uh, the flowers come by the stands and the clock. Um, later on, it got modernized a bit more. And nowadays, it's actually a fully digitized system and people can, on their laptop, also join this. Uh, there's 35 
separate clocks on which people can bid. Um, and what you also see nowadays is that uh, the plants actually don't go through the, through the stands anymore, and especially people remotely can also not see it, so that's a problem. And this is the problem we're uh, solving, because uh, what the auction then decided was that everybody has to uh, supply, mandatory has to supply a picture of, of the goods that they deliver. Now, you can imagine that uh, taking quality pictures is not per se a priority for all the growers. So uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's really hard to compare if everybody takes them differently. So they came up with some standards at which they, uh, at which they have to adhere the pictures. So the, the buyers can better see what they are buying. One other reason for having these standards is that these pictures also go to web shops. And you don't want like this whole rainbow of various picture types uh, on there, uh, which are actually selling the same product. Uh, so that's not a good property. So there has to be some standard, which we all agree on. Uh, examples of these requirements of uh, standards are, for example, that if you sell a single plant, that there has to be a ruler on the photo, because then you can see how big the plant is. Or uh, once they are sold in a, in a tray, then the tray also has to be on the photo, because then you can see it. Uh, and the background also has to be like a white background, or for white flowers, maybe gray, uh, but definitely not black, because it gives you also uh, different perception of, uh, of what is actually being sold. So we get a lot of flowers, we sell a lot of flowers, and people buy a lot of flowers. Uh, you can imagine that checking all of these images by hand is not really a feasible uh, project. It's actually what's happening before we did it. But they can no way check every day all the, all the pictures that are coming in. So at that point, it was decided, let's use computer vision or uh, something uh, in that area to to determine whether these pictures uh, meet the requirements or not. So that's where the data science and data engineering team comes in, which I'm part of. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, everybody is using this image, I noticed. Uh, we started working with um, Keras and TensorFlow. So basically what you do is you put, um, for different properties, we put the training data in, we train a neural net, uh, and then uh, something comes out of it. But we didn't, of course, construct row neural net, we used a pre-trained network, in this case VGG16, uh, we used, uh, and what we do is the well-known transfer learning trick, so you take the pre-trained network, you cut off his head, and then you train the last few layers again based on your training data. For the people who have been on the, at the tutorials on Friday, it's, they all know how to do this now, I suppose. Um, but yeah, then we can, for each model, we can train our own network. Uh, we put this whole thing uh, in, in this uh, box and made sort of a console application out of it so you can just point it to the training data and uh, for every uh, property on a picture we can then uh, train a separate uh, neural net. Now, there's something you should know about our team. Uh, we, <laughs> we do a lot of things and one of the things we take great pride in is that we uh, name basically everything that we build. And, uh, I'm, my background is in computer scientists, if, or in computer science, and we're really terrible at naming things, so hopefully maybe I can kind of judge which are the good names today. <laughs> this particular item was named Mariana, and it was named Mariana because, Mariana because of the Mariana Trench, because it's the deepest point in the ocean or on the Earth. And uh, you can guess the connection, it's really terrible, people. Uh, it gets worse, trust me. So, um, one thing is good to note is that not every problem has to be solved by deep learning, I suppose. Um, we have um, some properties that are in itself easier to solve. Uh, so what we also did, and what I further will not really talk about anymore today, is that we also have a heuristics-based approach with simpler machine learning models, uh, like in scikit-learn or something like that. Um, that is pretty much a similar thing to Mariana, except it's not deep learning. We call it Hureka because it's something our boss called when he came up with the greatest statistic in his, uh, in his career. I'm looking at you, Remco, if you see this, then uh, uh, yeah, he's very proud of it. Um, <laughs> so what these two things do is, uh, well, they generate models. We feed them with training data and they generate models for every property, well, for all kinds of properties. So these are nine. I think we will expand uh, very quickly in the, next in the near future. What you then need to do is, of course, um, well, people need to start using it, but they can't uh, because they don't know how to run a deep learning model. So obviously, we slap an API on it. Um, and that API we place in a Docker container, which is really uh, good to, uh, well, to get a decent environment and to deploy it easily. And we're very flexible that way. Um, this particular component we named Imagical because it magically extracts all these features from 
from the images, yes. <laughs> I don't know. So what does Emergical do? Uh, you can send an image to it, and it went down for each of the models, for each of the properties that we're looking at. Uh, it will return this JSON with, well, it's not a probability, but with like a score for how, uh, how uh, or, or if that uh, object is available or is present in the picture or not. Now, that's great that we have this, but it doesn't say if that picture is correct or not. So for that, we also need um, the actual rules that the business uh, people have uh, made, so the clock photo standards. And we need some metadata about what sh supposedly should be in the picture. Um, so we also need a product code and a first code. So first is basically the container that it's in. So in this case, it's a tray. Um, and based on all that information, we can then decide, okay, this photo is correct or not. We also built a component for that, an uh, API, so we put the rules in there. Uh, it actually also calls some other services which contain uh, information about uh, the products uh, based on the product code. And uh, that component also calls Emergical, asks, are these properties really in the picture? And based on that, it can make a decision. So uh, it's basically a decision engine. We named this component Judy. And yes, it was named Judy because of the judge Judy. <laughs> Because, yeah, it's a decision engine and it uh, decides on all kinds of things. <laughs> you can imagine our, um, our meetings about this. <laughs> okay, so uh, now we have the system in place and it runs and it's great. But we are, of course, not done because this is not like it works and uh, it was great uh, testing this. Uh, but there's like we know what training uh, set, like how, how accurate it is, um, how well we are able to extract these things from the test set. But we don't know actually, uh, we don't know still, don't know anything about the real world accuracy. And also, um, probably when we implement this, people will uh, start to provide better images because they get a lot of feedback and say, uh, well, this is shit image, please provide a better one. Um, so we also want to keep our models to, to go with their time and kind of uh, update themselves to uh, get higher standards. So we need to get some kind of feedback. So we built a feedback API for that. Uh, it's called Vogue, after the image catalog. And um, basically what you do to that is you send an image to it uh, with the labels for, for all the properties or a subset of them. And it will, we will hash the image based on the content. We use an image hash library for that. And then it stores the image on S3 and uh, with the labels with it. And so we can get some feedback. But uh, of course, like there's a quality team that does these checks, checks the images, checks also if uh, what's on the image is actually what's also delivered on the card, uh, cards and all. Um, I actually uh, joined them once to see how they work. And uh, you have to get out of bed really, really, really early. Uh, and then you're in the freezer uh, at uh, really low temperatures uh, without a nice jacket because you didn't think of bringing one. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I walked with these people and they are, of course, not people who are like they work maybe uh, 40 years at the company. They're, they're not going to send images uh, to the API or take an image. Um, so what they actually do in the morning is they uh, go into the system where all the, all the things that are delivered are listed. They export an Excel sheet, and then they, uh, well, it, it's a subset of everything that's been delivered because they can't handle everything. And basically, they go through the, through the refrigerators or cool cells, and they will check like, if what's on the, on the cart is actually also on the image in that system. Now, what we built is a tool for them to help uh, do these checks. So uh, it's really great, and we named it Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so basically what happens is that they can upload the Excel of the things that they are going to check to this. It contains all the information. Um, we will uh, take that information and then send all of the items one by one. We send them to uh, Judy. Uh, actually, I have that note down. We send it by Judy, and then we generate these uh, these switches where you can press, uh, or you get the prediction of Judy, and you can also change it if you think it's not correct. And once you do, it's actually b sent back to Vogue. Uh, so, and in that way, we get really, I think this is a really important step for bringing any model to production, is that you have this feedback loop in it. I think that's uh, really a key. I think Yannis um, uh, yesterday talked about it, I think. I think it was Yannis. Uh, and it's really good. So what we get now is uh, both from, uh, for each and every single model, we get like an overview for images that are correct according to that person and that are incorrect. So we can also see something about, uh, well, we get the training data, but we can also see how, how, how it's balanced. And uh, what we also get is uh, the predictions of Judy we also store. So we can also see how our model is predicting things, like in terms of how it's distributed over the, over the scores. So if it's really skewed to one side or the other side or gets like that over time. 
we can actually actively monitor it. And I, I really think this is a really key, uh, key piece in our infrastructure. Um, talking about the architecture or the infrastructure itself, this is uh, an image we created. Uh, so what we get is uh, we have a magical, we have Judy. I hope it's uh, really visible. Uh, but we have a magical, we have Judy, we have Vogue. And uh, all these APIs are behind the... Uh, uh, it's all deployed on AWS, and it's deployed behind the API, API gateway. And uh, we have this single sign-on solution, it's called Okta, and the API gateway does all the security for us. So I don't know if Melanie is still in the room. Please don't hack us. <laughs> I, uh, I think it's secure, but <laughs> don't do it. Um, so what we can do from that is that, uh, well, all, all the systems, all the use cases, everybody who wants to use this API can just go through the API, authenticate. We have control of who can do that, and uh, they can access our APIs. If people send an image to Vogue, it's stored on S3. And then, uh, well, we use Airflow. This is really a nice uh, setup for us, because the next talk will also be uh, relevant. But uh, we can, in Airflow, we can schedule something that says, uh, every week, please uh, retrain the models based on the new training data, or something like that. It can fire up some task. The models will be stored in the Artifactory, which we also have as a managed, uh, managed service. We can also store big uh, files in there. Um, and then, in the end, uh, if that's successful, if we are confident that what is trained uh, should go to production, we, um, we, we trigger a deploy and a magical gets updated with all the models. I think that's really, uh, really cool. Um, you can forget a bit about this part, because it's really due to legacy and uh, platform uh, things that we build it like that, but um, Excellent uh, has the backend uh, right here. It, uh, it uses, uh, to keep state, it uses DynamoDB. We call that JSON born because it stores JSON objects. <laughs> <laughs> we also have something uh, for another project. It's called Steven, Steven SQL. It's also <laughs> uh, terrible. <laughs> anyway, uh, the front end is hosted on some other place, but uh, don't really care about it. Uh, all the logging and monitoring, we just use uh, the logs go to S3, and we use CloudWatch for metrics and Grafana for dashboarding. Um, so yeah, I think it's cool. I haven't told anything yet about what API we use. I don't really have time for it, but we experimented with Senic because you can see that a lot of uh, it's a, oh, who knows Senic or who doesn't? Uh, yeah. Who knows Senic? <laughs> Not a lot of people. Okay, it's really comparable to Flask, uh, but it's async. It can handle asynchronous requests, and you see that we have a lot of I/O and, and network uh, requests, and we thought it would really benefit from that. Like, if you want to know more about this, uh, ask me in the end or come find me. Um, but yeah, we, we now have this architecture, it works, it runs, and uh, we get feedback so we can monitor model performance. But there's, of course, also the performance of, um, of the whole thing itself. Um, well, the big powerhouse of this whole thing is Imagical, because that runs the actual deep learning stuff. Um, and we noticed when we were doing this locally, it was pretty fast, we were pretty, pretty okay with it. But when we put it in the cloud on some uh, ECS cluster, um, it was actually very slow. It was like more than one and a half seconds slow, and we were not really happy with that. So we started investigating, okay, why, uh, why is this the case? So what happens in a magical uh, is this. You send an image, it reads and parses the image, it resizes it to fit the network uh, the pre or the neural net specifications. We then run it through the, uh, through the neural net layers, the VGG16 layers. And then what comes out of this, we can use multiple times for the end of uh, the, the last layers for every model, right? So it's, it's actually executing sequentially, but it's of course not, like the output does not go through this. But, uh, but this is what's happening. So we started to measuring which step costs a lot of time, and we found that actually, like the vast majority of the time was, was, it was in the VGG16 part. Uh, so one of the things we learned, because we started this a while back, and uh, TensorFlow, I think the version we were using was 1.4 release candidate. Um, we then upgraded TensorFlow to uh, 1.8, and uh, it uh, went from like one and a half, 1600 milliseconds to 900, 950. So that was a really big um, improvement in speed. So if you have anything running in production, be sure to check this. Um, but that was, of course, not fast enough. So we investigated further. And well, we, we tried to use different uh, instance types on, on Amazon to check uh, what the performance was. And what you notice, so this was our ECS cluster, which is used by the whole department, actually. Um, when we put it on there, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty slow, but uh, we then tried larger instances with more cores, and it started to pick up speed, and it really became a lot faster. So TensorFlow, of course, uh, um, 
well, getting more cores, it will, be, uh, it will become faster. And what we also tried uh, are a few GPU instances. Um, we can actually run a Docker container uh, on a GPU instance on Amazon, and it can use the GPU for processing. And it's really, like you can see it, uh, it was really fast. So if you put it on this P3 instance, it went, well, if, you, if you think we did this probably in a week, all of this, uh, this benchmarking, and it went from 1600 milliseconds to under 50. So that's like uh, a lot of uh, speed up, which we were really happy with. Also, Amazon has Elastic GPU, so we thought, well, this is really cool. We can just attach an Elastic GPU to whatever something, but it's only available for Windows machines. So if you're okay with doing that, then uh, go ahead, but we are not. Um, uh, the one thing, of course, like you don't get, there's no such thing as a free lunch. We've heard it multiple times. Um, you also have costs. So I, I use now the on-demand pricing as a, uh, as a proxy for this, but what you see is that uh, this P3 instance is by far the fastest, but it's also really, really expensive. What, what is nice, though, is that you have like this sort of equal pricing here while performance goes up. So if you make a price-performance comparison chart, uh, which I did, um, you can see which instance is actually most cost-effective. Uh, and you would see that the P2 uh, uh, GPU instance is actually, if you process 100K images sequentially, then this is definitely the, the cheapest option. But this is, of course, like a, uh, this is not like a realistic scenario. We wouldn't always have 100k images to process all day long. Um, so yeah, you need to do s like you, you come into the topic of scaling. So if this is our load, like the blue line, um, we we have actually we have a batch load, like all the stuff that comes in is being delivered every day. But we also have a photo app in which people can take photo and instantly get an answer: is this a correct image or not? And those are two different use cases. Uh, one, we don't really have to process it really quick, and the other one, we do want to process really quick. Anyway, if you want to go into the batch load, uh, we can, of course, just put up a really big, fast machine, a really expensive one, and it would definitely be able to handle your load. The problem is, while your batch load is going down, you're still paying a lot of money to have this super expensive machine running and super fast machine. So what you also can do is pick a smaller machines, like multiple smaller machines, and handle, like, you can kind of scale with your load, and it's far more cost-effective. Um, but uh, you take a penalty, of course, uh, in, in your response time, because it will be slower to handle all the VGG um, TensorFlow stuff, and uh, that's also not for us a good property. So we're trying to now find a, like a middle, middle ground where we do have some form of, of performance in terms of response time, but we don't really... Um, um, but, but we still have... Uh, like a cost-effective solution, and we're looking into multiple things. So, I, yeah, we're not really done uh, with this part, I guess. Uh, so you can put it on ECS with auto scaling. Um, we looked into Fargate, which is a new Amazon thing, um, where you can basically run containers and don't have to care about clusters. So it's nicer ECS, I suppose. Uh, but it didn't have. Uh, you you can only run four cores per container, I think. So that's not maybe. Uh, maybe in the future they will increase it. Um, next talk will be about Kubernetes. I don't know who the speaker is. I haven't seen him, but I'll definitely go there to check uh, what's going on there. And I think the, the direction that we are actually moving is Amazon Spot Fleet. So you can basically um, well, tell Amazon I need this much processing power. It will check which instances are now really cheap in terms of spot pricing. And it will then spin up enough spot instances to give you that, uh, to be able to, to give you that processing power that you, that you need. So some key learnings, I suppose. Uh, We've gone from this small uh, real-world problem into, I think, a mature solution. I think we're quite successful in that. Um, I think it's good that you're involved end-to-end. -end. So you're, you start talking with the business about this problem, and in the end, we're also making sure that the feedback loop is OK and monitoring that our models are really good. I sometimes hear of people in companies that are data scientists, and then they get thrown this problem of, OK, please find if there's a ruler in this image. And then once they have a model that does this, they throw it over. Uh, to the next team or to whatever, and somebody else handles it. I think it's really cool that we get to be involved in all of this, and we have a team of engineers and scientists who cooperate in this. I think it's really good. What's also good, I think, that we did is that we, we iterated over this, uh, over this process. So the way that I told you is also about how we, uh, how we did it. So we, get with this, we deliver something every now and then, and uh, it looks good because we can also demo it to people. And the effect of demoing things a lot to people is that everybody gets on board, everybody gets excited, and people actually come with new use cases for your, uh, 
for, for your solution, actually. So we started with one problem and we solved it. Uh, but in the end, we actually solved maybe multiple problems because people were like, oh, this is cool, I want this. Um, so, and also important to really be involved with the end users. We're solving a business problem. We're not really looking to, okay, let's do a cool TensorFlow uh, project and let's just uh, go ahead with it and, uh, and um, make us look uh, good as a team. We actually want to add some value with this, with this whole thing. And, well, once again, I can stress it, think about monitoring your uh, models, uh, I guess. One other thing, um, well, microser microservices and Docker is great. I don't think I have to tell this crowd. I think everybody pretty much uh, does stuff with Docker. Uh, especially the maintainability part, what we also want to do is create our own Docker image with this API stuff in it. Uh, so all our dependencies in, in, uh, like related to the API part, we can just manage in one place instead of uh, updating multiple components. Um, also, managed services, I think it's also really great. You don't want to spend a lot of time in the devops uh, your your whole your whole stuff. So if something is managed and you can use it, use it. Also, don't throw deep learning at every problem. Uh, again, it's not the solution to, to add, uh, everything. Um, sometimes something simpler works as well or something else works even better. Uh, definitely had to say this because Remco told me to. Uh, and, well, last but not least, the key learning. If you get the chance to name all your uh, all your <laughs> all your components, this is really uh, like it really makes your meetings better. And especially when people come and join your meeting from outside who don't know about them, they're like, "What is this about?" There's this Judy thing, and yeah, it's really. <laughs> I think it's really amazing and takes uh, the funny, it keeps the funny in your project. So I guess that was it. Thank you all. So thank you, Dick. That was the best talk I've ever seen about naming conventions. Um, <laughs> some people might say it was excellent. Um, oh, you really hate that. I'm yeah. not a fan of that name. No. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, we, I can't lie about it. We have plenty of time. We have like five minutes for questions easy. So um, what might be the easiest way? Yeah, let's just pass the mic. So I have two questions. The first one is, uh, uh, do you consider predicting the category of uh, you know, a plant so you can make the quality checking process more automatic? Uh, uh, there's another one. So do they, uh, did you consider, you know, uh, did you consider uh, compiling uh, TensorFlow in your, I, I don't know, in your uh, uh, virtual machines to, to make it uh, run faster? Yeah, okay, so I'll start with the second question because um, we thought about it, yes. <laughs> We haven't done it yet. Like I think now that we have the whole system in place and we can measure everything, and actually next week uh, or this week is the kickoff where people start to give us the training data, we can actually look at this kind of optimizations in the real world with, with us getting all the, all the feedback and all. So this is definitely something we want to do. So multiple outputs uh, compiled, uh, yes. Uh, also, we want to try different pre-trained models. So currently we're using VG16, but maybe something else is faster or better. Or we can definitely look into that. Um, the first question, remind me. <laughs> uh, types of plants. Flowers. Oh yeah, types of plants, yes. Uh, I had also a very good answer for that. Uh, we actually had an incubator and uh, we visited that and there were some uh, startup busy or were, were, were busy processing these things and determining which plant uh, was on the picture. Generally, this is not really a problem for us because uh, if a buyer sends us plants, and he delivers roses, but they are in fact tulips or something else. Uh, somebody will, if, if the quality team doesn't see it, which because they can't check everything, then the customer will get delivered tulips instead of roses and will very quickly be on the phone like, this is not roses, this is tulips. And it, it will fix itself. Like grows generally don't give wrong information about product. Now, um, the, the first, like the, the, the container it's delivered in, that is actually a problem. And uh, uh, that happens a lot where people put in wrong first codes or wrong, uh, wrong type. But that's also something we, uh, we can capture with this right now. So we train for different types of containers. So yes. Yeah. Next question. Yep. Really nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, what is the business case? What can you say? I'm really curious about the numbers. Uh, about the, you mean you talk money, right? Or is yeah, it yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess there's two things. So one is um, customer satisfaction is at least one of the, the value cases, I would suppose. So uh, if the quality gets better, if the, the, the images are better, generally 
like, a, like if you want to buy something, a nice computer, you can buy a computer that has been photographed in some uh, dark uh, alley somewhere with, uh, I don't know, maybe a few drug addicts lying around. <laughs> or you have like, you have like Apple, who gives you this super shiny thing with all the chimes and whatnot. And generally, you'll buy that faster, I suppose, if the price, well, if it's comparable. So that's one thing. Like, it's just easier for everybody to compare all these plants. Uh, and generally, that, that increases customer satisfaction and maybe also uh, the prices. Um, and the other thing is that, well, if we need to have a quality team uh, with a large size to check all of these things, that's really, like, people are more expensive than this TensorFlow framework. So if we can... If we can capture just more of the of these things and uh, and help them and steer them in the right direction, that will definitely uh, make their job easier, better, and faster. So yes. Do you measure the effect of the feedback loop? Uh, the effect? Yeah. For the improvement. Uh, well, yes. <laughs> What, what do you mean exactly? Like we measure what uh, what what the models predict. We measure yeah, what people yeah. say, and then we can uh, yeah, we can say something about the real world accuracy. Like how good are we? Yeah. How how good is it after you have like a feedback oh, loop model? That I cannot tell you because this week we will actually like uh, the kickoff was supposed to happen past week. So then I would have all the numbers here for you. But now the we have been evaluating it in the past few weeks, and we have been uh, like a few people have been running it and working with it, and now. Uh, and well, next week I have to instruct basically the whole uh, team to uh, to start using it. Then we like we get really the size, I guess, to say this. But currently I cannot I cannot give you a number, unfortunately. But like from training data and stuff, we were like upper uh, like 1995 upper uh, region. So I think we can get it. Like like we're actually more. Co it's not necessarily maybe about accuracy of how uh, for for each. Like if you just count, are we correct about this plant or not? But we're actually really looking for maybe it's the wrong ones. We want to be able to identify the wrong ones, and I think false positives are, are, are not as bad, but false negatives are. So, I don't know, we have, like, training accuracy is really not really predictive for the, the real-world accuracy that we're looking for. So, it's, uh, it's something I cannot tell right now because we simply have, don't have enough data yet. Uh, what's the usual reason that the feedback says your prediction is not right? Is it about specific uh, Objects you're predicting or determination? Sorry, sorry. So the uh, because in your model you have different uh, items you want to predict if it's there, mm -hmm. and then you try to combine them to see if the picture is good or not. So according to the feedback, what's the usual reason they find your model is not good? Uh, so yeah, we do measure for like of course we measure it on like a picture as a whole, but we also measure it for each specific model. <laughs> um, I think. Like it differs a bit. For plants, uh, the rules are somewhat less strict, and everybody is already maybe doing it good. So the usual things are that, uh, like they have a miniature plant, or they put a logo somewhere where they're not supposed to, uh, those type of things. But for flowers, it's really people get really creative, uh, and they make this. They have like professional photo photographers and, um, and and Photoshop people, and they make this whole piece of art, which looks really nice. But when you show it to our model, it's like, what is this thing? And all kinds of things show up that are wrong and, uh, and, and well, in the end it leads to that the picture is, uh, has to be looked at by somebody, so that's good, I suppose. But I think those type of pictures are now the hardest because they're not really adhering to the standards, but we pick them out anyway, so it's, uh, yeah. Uh, we are running out of time and, I, and we, we would love to hear more names and stuff, but that has to happen in the break. Uh, can we all yeah. give it one last final applause to Derek? <laughs>